Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the RRAR interview series. Today, joining me is the CEO of RRAR, Dave Phillips. Dave, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, sure. This sounds fun. <laughs> All right. So the first question um, I have for you is, when you came to RAR and assessed the association where it was at the time, what were some of the things that uh, you wanted to accomplish in your tenure here as CEO. Um, and um, now that your time as CEO is winding down, how do you feel you were able to accomplish those goals? Yeah, interesting question. Uh, yeah, so we were in pretty bad shape when I got here, coming off of COVID, uh, new CEO change, um, that type of thing. Um, we were had other staff vacancies um, due to retirements, uh, sicknesses, all sorts. Of, it was it was a rough time for uh, for the association uh, staff in particular, and of course that bleeds over into it being a rough time for the members. Um, so my first goal and the reason I was originally hired as an interim here was to stabilize the staff situation to to make sure um, we were building a, a strong staff and. Uh, I've been super proud at, at uh, how well we've accomplished that. And I think uh, the staff we have here right now is better than uh, than any staff I've had the pleasure of working with. And it's just a bunch of top-notch people that are true professionals at what they do. And uh, they're doing a fantastic job for our members. Appreciate that. And, um, you know, from our perspective, we appreciate always the way you've uh, handled us as a staff and it's been a pleasure working with you as well. So my next question, I want to talk about your career a little bit. You've been in the business for a long time and you've served as a CEO at other associations prior to coming to RAR. Um, what do you think that main component that separates RAR from the other associations you've been with? And, you know, what do you think makes this association special? Sure. Uh, well, large local associations, which is what we are, um, mega even they call us, um, uh, are a, a unique beast. And um, it is one I didn't have. I, so I was a, a, a AE at a thousand person association and then at a state AE. Um, so uh, at a 30,000 uh, in Pennsylvania, they have about 30,000 members roughly. Sure. Um, so to do a large local association was really attractive to me because uh, I like the fact that the local association is really close to the members. You really get to uh, know the members, you get to interact with the members all the time. And to be able to, to do that on uh, at a association that has the scale to do some uh, amazing things. Uh, I saw this as a, a kind of a diamond in the rough place that could really, really take off um, if they, you know, just got a, a little more, well, better staff, number one, uh, stable staff, better staff, as well as become more strategically focused. Um, we, we didn't really have uh, a, a guiding strategic plan. We had one, but it was aspirational in nature. Um, and we've now over the last couple of years have developed a very uh, action-oriented strategic plan. Um, and when you do that with a, a large association like this, you can really uh, change the world and change, you know, your part of the world anyway, and, and make a big difference for your members. And I, I think we're just starting to see um, how that uh, can affect an association like this. And I think, I think we're looking at a really bright future of being able to, um, uh, I guess, blossom and uh, mature into a, a, a dominant association um, that uh, that we necessarily haven't been in the past for our size. So we grew very rapidly. So we, we really hadn't caught up uh, with our growth. It's kind of like a kid going through a growth skirt, uh, uh, spurt and not having the right kind of uh, right uh, size shoes and clothes to wear and, you know, that type of thing. We're we're, we're having to uh, re-outfit ourselves and and we've done that. And now it's time to really blossom and take advantage of our size, our strength, uh, and our talented staff and our and our and our wonderful members. That's great. Um, switching gears a little bit um, away from our association, I want to talk about the industry um, as a whole. Um, how do you feel about the current changes that are facing the realtor industry, um, compiled with the economy, housing shortage, portability issues, all that stuff? Mm -hmm. What do you think the outlook is for the industry in the near future? 
Well, I think for the real estate industry, it's um, it's fine. Um, we've gone through bigger changes than what we're currently going through. Um, we uh, I've been around long enough to I remember before we even had buyer agency, uh, it wasn't even a thing um, before the Internet. Uh, you know, those things were uh, transformational to the entire business and the and the industry adapted, the industry adjusted. And, um, you know, when you're going through that change, it's rough. But um, after you get through it, it's amazing. And so uh, today we can't even begin to think of what we would do without the Internet or without buyer agency. I mean, I, like. Nobody can even fathom that anymore, uh, but we used to. And when it started, when we started looking at well, buyer agency, oh, that's that's crazy stuff. We don't we don't want to do that. Um, and a lot of people fought it and and uh, kind of were bought in kicking and screaming. But once they tasted it, uh, once they got through the initial um, change uh, emotions and everything, they adopted it and and became commonplace. What we're currently going through with the settlement and the change of practice and and how uh, we have commission uh, discussions and such that will all work its way out it, it may take a couple of years of a little bit of unknowns and turmoil but uh, on the other side of that i think uh, we can look at uh, really some really uh, wonderful things um, and maybe a different perspective that we hadn't had I heard a speaker on a panel we just had today, I, I thought was uh, really well put. And they said, when when a realtor gets uh, a, a listing appointment to go do it there, they get all prepared, they have a whole speech, they have a booklet, they have all, all sorts of stuff. And they go make sure they give a great presentation, show the value and all the things they're going to do for that. Uh, but we haven't really had that same focus with buyer agency. And perhaps now that we're having to have the conversations that before used to be, uh, oh, you want me to be your buyer agent, just sign here. And we and we really didn't explain it as much or put as much emphasis on it as we do listing presentations. So um, that's probably a good change in the long run. Uh, and we'll probably be uh, build a lot more loyal uh, clients and uh, a lot uh, better business practice uh, for our members. So I think once we get through this change, it'll be just like all the other ones. It'll be become so normal and so accepted and so uh, obvious that why you know why why didn't we do this years ago type thing? Yeah, that's um that's a good perspective because I think from what I've heard from some members is is that there always is a little bit of uncertainty and panic when something new comes up. But for you to talk about the changes that you've experienced and that there has been more daunting changes, um, that's uh, I think I think that's important. Um, so following up on that a little bit, um, if you had a magic wand and could make changes to the association space or to the industry, uh, as a whole, is there anything that you would change to make it maybe easier or just something that you would like to see um, to improve upon doing business? Hmm. For the industry or for the association? Uh, either one, whatever, whatever, whatever you think is the number one, you know, yeah. maybe not issue, but just something you would like to see, sure. see uh, improved upon. Yeah. So I think the kind of sneaky one that people are paying attention to a little bit, but aren't necessarily fully on board with is AI uh, right now. Um, there's so much AI can do for us and we don't know yet. We, we, have, we don't understand it yet. We haven't adapted it yet. We're, we, we think AI is chat GPT or something where we could, you know, get it to write us a, 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 a you know, a, a article or something. Get on um, your book all, all, <laughs> yeah. All those are good, but uh, how about, you know, I mean, through the MLS, I think there's going to be some dramatic changes with uh, the use of AI and um, also with the practice of real estate. Um, you know, uh, we can automate so much more than we did. Um, and I'm not scared of automation, but I think a lot of people are that it will replace realtors or something like that. Same argument we heard when, when the Internet was invented. You know, we won't need realtors anymore. Well, we got twice as many realtors as we had back then. Yeah. Uh, so uh, not not the case. You know, uh, we adapted that uh, technology. And so that's what the industry really needs to do is to look at AI and say, how can we make this work for us? 
Um, and otherwise it, it'll overrun us potentially if we're, if we're not the captains of it, if we're not going to embrace it and, and, uh, be the boss and, and, and say, AI, you're going to work for me, not the opposite. That's a good point. I think that's good, um, advice for everybody who's about to deal with AI is to get out in front of it. Um, a couple more questions for you and I appreciate your time. Um, as an accomplished CEO in this industry, what's your advice to a, CEO coming into a new place? And um, second part of that question, what's your advice to members that are getting a new CEO? That's a, a great question for us right now. Uh, exactly. <laughs> um, it, we don't know yet who the new CEO is going to be uh, when we're recording this uh, podcast. But uh, the most important thing that I found is uh, what I call, and which is commonly known as onboarding. Um, so we need to onboard this new CEO correctly and positively and get them positioned to be successful. Uh, too often, uh, the, the the statistics are out there uh, where 40% of C new CEOs fail, uh, and it's typically related to poor onboarding. And onboarding is uh, a complicated in a little ways, but in the simplest form, it's it's the first 60 days. If you just think about that, who who is the, uh, this person being introduced to? What are the first impressions that uh, that person gets? And um, you know, my job as the current CEO, when we do get a new one, is to make sure I help through that process in a very positive fashion and help uh, help this person understand who they need to uh, get out and see and visit and 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 become uh, colleagues with and and uh, which other organizations are important to our success here at RRAR um, and, and all those sort of things, uh, as well as uh, help that person understand our culture here and uh, that type of thing. So if, if we've made a good hire for our culture uh, and that person can adapt to our culture uh, pretty quickly uh, and we onboard them properly, get them off on the right foot, their chances of success go up enormously. If we don't do all those things, then the chances go way down. So, um, I, you know, my plan is to do whatever I can to help them, whatever they want to do, whatever they need uh, to make sure they get off on the right foot. And if we do that, I think I think we're, we'll have a, a successful transition. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And all right, my final question for you, two parter. Um, I know, you know, like you mentioned, while we're recording this um a new CEO is on the way. We don't know who that is yet. And you're going to have a lot of time to uh, talk to a bunch of the members. Um, obviously, you're not going to be able to talk to every member as we have so many. So first part of this question um, is now that you're leaving RRAR, is there anything you'd want to say to the members or a message you want to give to the members on your time here or the future of the association? Hmm. Wow. That's an open book there. Um <laughs> So, you know, just thanks. Uh, it's been 34 years I've been in the realtor business, as I call it. And, um, you know, I'm super proud of what this organization has accomplished for the community, um, the good we do in the community. Uh, I like to say it's all about community to us. Um, and, you know, our realtor giving network that we have is is just a great example of that. And I've been fortunate to be part of some housing foundations and uh, different um, other community service type things over the years. Uh, and that's what really uh, makes me feel so warm and fuzzy about this organization. I, I think we're amazing at that. And it's one of our strengths. Um, and one of the things that uh, our members seem to be passionate about and uh, who wouldn't want to hang out for 34 years with people that are really concerned about their community and trying to make a difference with everything from homelessness to, uh, uh, you know, food, uh, you know, pantries and all that sort of stuff. We do we do so many things. I like to say that there's not a, uh, a nonprofit board of directors uh, in the area and in any area where there's a strong realtor presence that doesn't have a realtor on it. Uh, you know, they're, they're almost always there. They're very active people. And to have the privilege of working alongside people that believe in, in community service uh, is something that uh, has always made me super proud uh, to do. Um, 
we we have um we're we're at an inflection point in lots of ways right now here at RRAR. We've got new CEO coming. Um, we've got a new strategic plan that we need to uh, develop. And between those two, that's going to set the direction for the next few years. And my hope is that it'll be a positive forward direction that will uh, capture our ability as a large association to do great things. Um, I'm not sure we're at that mindset yet. I'm not sure we understand that we're a big association and we can do big things. Um, but there's other associations that aren't as big as us that that have done some amazing things out there. And we need to we need to look around and look at ourselves and decide, you know, do we want to just keep doing little panel seminars or do we want to, you know, maybe start a, a an organization that does some serious good in the community or uh, it becomes a way to become more politically active or whatever the case may be, whatever the, the members decide they want to focus on, we need to think bigger. And um, I think we're at that inflection point where we now have the staff, we have the resources, we've gotten our finances in order. Um, and with the new CEO coming in, hopefully they'll, they'll energize the whole crew to, to really I call it grow up. Frankly, um, you know, we're we've we've grow, had our growth spurt. Now it's time to mature and try to um, to really capitalize on uh, on the strength that we have as an organization. Instead of thinking down here, we need to really raise the bar on, on what we know we can do if we really put our minds to it and really put our efforts toward it. That's great, and um, I think people will appreciate that message. The last thing I wanted to ask you, sort of a fun one to end on. If you want to share, if you don't, that's perfectly fine as well. But any fun retirement plans or anything you want to accomplish in the next phase of your uh, personal and I'll still call it professional life because you, you're, I know you're still going to work on stuff. So anything like that you'd like to share with anybody? Yeah, I, I call it refiring, not retiring. Um, so, uh, you know, you just kind of refire your career in a, in a different direction that brings you great joy and pleasure uh, and isn't work as much as as uh, being a CEO is uh, when you know you don't have to worry about uh, a whole staff and a bunch of members and board meetings and all that you can really apply your your talents and skills in an area that uh, brings you that great joy and so uh, I'm I'm gonna I, I don't know exactly what that means uh, per se but um, I do know that um, I have some life goals that uh, are unfulfilled, including uh, writing a lot more books. Um, I've got four books now, and and uh, I still want to write several more. So um, that that's going to be a big focus of mine, uh, as well as finding my niche and something that brings me great joy, a volunteer job or whatever. Um, and what uh, has always brought me joy um, through the consulting company that I've had for years um, is leadership training. And so I'm, I'm going to, uh, really focus, uh, my, my next phase of my career, uh, at least on the leadership part of things and, and trying to help people become better leaders. Cause I think the whole world needs that. And certainly our organization, both local, national state, uh, they need better and, uh, trained leaders. Ones we've got good people maybe, but they don't understand leadership. And i and, I'm kind of on that mission to help people learn leadership and understand how their actions and their uh, skills as a leader affect the rest of the organization and the people around them. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, it, it, it won't feel like work when you're uh, when you're at that point. So uh, refiring. Refiring and uh, finding more time to play golf, I hope. Um, oh, yeah, there's that, too. <laughs> So um, before I let you go, just, you know, uh, obviously I'm going to talk to you personally before you leave, but I wanted to let everyone know a little bit of background on uh, why I came to RAR. One reason was I wanted to be a government affairs director. It was sort of in my career path with being involved in government affairs and legislative uh, work for my whole career. But, you know, a uh, huge reason, 90% of the reason is because of you. And when I interviewed with you, just your direction and, um, I believe in what you told me and, um, you know, I believed in you, I guess, to a certain extent and wanted to work for you. And um, I'm just really appreciative of 
the way you've taken me under your wing. You've certainly become my mentor uh, and a friend and um, somebody that I know I'm always going to stay in contact with. You've meant a lot to me. And I, I, I've, I've always told people that I've been fortunate enough. You hear horror stories about bosses. Um, in my career, I have never had a bad boss. I've been at a few different places. Um, I've had great bosses, but to me, you are the best boss I've ever had, number one. And number two, I came here at a time in my personal and professional life where I just needed some direction and um, you've provided me that on a lot of levels. So I'm, I'm always going to be thankful um, for you and uh, the way you've allowed um, yourself to be a mentor to me. And I just wanted to say thank you for that. And um, I really appreciate it. And I wanted everybody who watches these to know uh, all of that. So just thank you. Well, you're most welcome. That's very, very kind of you to say. And I would just say we're very lucky to have you uh, here on staff. Thank you, Dave. Um, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you doing this. And I'm sure the membership will appreciate all the work you've done and also for giving them a little insight into um, sort of the end of your tenure here as we usher in a new CEO. So uh, thanks again. And um, we appreciate your time. Thanks.